You mentioned at the very start uh, a, a, a current account in surplus for a, for a dairy farm can be a dangerous thing. So given that 2017 is forecast for a reasonably good price, um, how or what advice would you give to reasonably good farmers, maybe stocked at three cows to the hectare, and feeling the need to expend for expansion's sake, and what investment criteria or what advice would you give to that farmer? So for me, Kevin, and, and, and those, those farmers do is I tell those farmers today, this evening, tomorrow, go out and do soil tests. Because it's the one thing that they can invest in this year, if milk price is good, that's going to give them a very good return, right? That's the first thing. Um, second thing I would do is look and, you know, be more cr critical around the opportunities that you evaluate. So um, there will and is many opportunities. You, you, you know, Robert talked there a minute ago about uh, opportunities that came to him. Uh, there will many opportunities come. So it's a case of doing a plan for it. Um, and, and for me, it, it should have, um, the plan should include the investment requirement and it should include uh, a, a set of numbers across the period and look at the return from that plan. And don't make the investment unless you can get a return that's, you know, that you're comfortable with. Uh, Just, is there a danger, though, that uh, farmers will push stocking rates and, oh, yeah. and, 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 and maybe not so much expend the land, but actually expend in a different way? Yeah, and, and, and that, for me, these numbers tell us that, that uh, uh, the trick for me is if you do your numbers, you won't make that mistake. And if you have your plan done, that, you know, th that's not going to happen. And, and this analysis for, for me tells me that if you drive the numbers too hard, in terms of what the farm can carry and the, um, you know, versus the feed that needs to come in, you're, you're at nothing. You're actually, the tip, you know, I often thought about running faster to stand still. What did that mean? And, and when I put that slide together, it just, it was absolutely clinical. You're running an awful lot far, faster, you're milking a lot more cows, but you're actually going backwards. Um, so, so it's a big danger. And, and Maybe we've been a little bit lucky in the last 18 months that, you know, milk price wasn't off the wall and we hadn't made stupid decisions. But I think we need to be clinical about the decisions we make from now on. Yeah. And will not allow a bull to be used on cows that's greater than 3% calf in difficulty. Might be conservative, but it's one of the things feeding into that calf and pattern later. There is no bull put on a cow or on a heifer that's more than 1.4% calf in difficulty and that bull has to have a calving survey. So we will not use a genomic bull on heifers unless they have a calving survey. So that often means, yes, we might be losing a small bit of genetic gain on the heifer calves out of the heifers, but very, very, yes, we are very small on it, but we're not going to risk a heifer having a difficult calving. Kevin, I'm stealing some of your thunder, and you might keep it for when the questions come up. I think you're saying is, I want to see a heifer calved, I don't want to see a heifer calving. I want to see a heifer calved. In other words, that she's an easy calving, she can spit out a calf. I've so the replacement heifers, in general, are coming out of the first heifer calves being born on the farm. Okay? So they're early. They're in a bunch together. It's easier to hit all the targets after that. So this is, maybe I have, if you're using Belgian blues and you're making big money for your calves, don't expect to hold on to a compact calving because you're forfeiting one for the other. Select easy calving bulls. Um, I'm not speaking on my own here today, I suppose. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Mary, my wife, and uh, my family because at the end of the day, it's a joint effort. And uh, our local club, I suppose, has, have a motto and it's together we're better. And I, I think the same thing holds true here today, maybe. Over the past 18 or 19 years, we're coming to conferences, we're learning from different people every day, and because of it, together, we are all better because of it. So I'd, I'd just like to say that at the outset. So what I'm also going to talk about, I suppose, is number one, labor. We all have labor on our farms, whether we're owner operators or we, do, we hire in labor to do the work. We need people to milk cows. So at certain times of the year, there are pressure points where we feel that there's too much work probably for one person or two persons to do. So we'll try and address some of those issues. Um, I'll also talk about labor saving devices. And what I mean about labor saving devices is that they allow the job to be done quicker, more efficiently, and that's probably a feel good factor that you know, you're doing the job efficiently and uh, getting it done quickly and a feel, a feel good factor about the place you work in. 
So we farming, because at the end of the day, that's what's most important. So the reasons we are farming is, number one, it's enjoyable. We like it. We like milking cows. But number two, it has to be profitable, because we have to put bread on the table. We have to live a life. And if we were working a job outside, you know, it must put, put money in your bank at the end of the day. It must be sustainable. So we, we must think ahead to know how are we going to position ourselves in years to come. Like, can we sustain ourselves going forward? And what is happening now that will we'll maintain that? But I would also throw in the, the other one, it, it must be challenging, because we like a challenge. We do a lot of repetitive work every day, but if there isn't a challenge or a goal that we can set, um, to me, to, uh, that, that's what gets us going in, in the morning. So just a small bit then on where I think the farmer of the future is going to be. To me, there's going to be two types of farmer in the future. The first farmer, and I call it inverted commas, is the farmer who will probably own the land. Because um, in this country, there is an attraction to land and there is an attachment to, to land. And it is very easily, or not easily given up. So Ireland is different to probably other countries in that regard. So, so with that in mind, I think the second farmer then will be most of what are probably here today they will combine their skills, their capital, and they will generate a return from land they probably own already and land that they will lease into the future. So with that in mind, there is going to be a greater workload on the farmer. He's going to probably milk more cows. He'll, maybe he'll milk the cows in one block, but then there will be outside support blocks for, um, with facilities maybe, with the way long-term leasing is going, because there are facilities in a lot of these farms that are coming up for rent now. Uh, he'll have to be a good grassman, a good stockman, and he'll always have to adapt to new technology, what's coming down the line. And that's where, I suppose, we're very well poised here in Ireland, in that we have a good advisory service, which is independent. We have discussion groups where farmers like here today can share information, and if we go to these conferences, we'll keep ourselves abreast of what's happening. Is it possible to lift profits hugely, even on our top performing farms? And the answer is yes. Uh, and I'm suggesting the top 10% of farmers with Halstein Treaton on grass per 100 hectares, something like 60 to 90,000 euros per year profit, extra profit, every year of money in your pocket. What makes the difference? Combining two things, grass, grass plus clover swords and crossbreds, as distinct will say from Friesian Halsteins, just in grass alone. The, um, Looking again at an intermediate price, 29 and a half cents, grass only, and we'll say that, um, first of all, we'll say just look at the, the breed effect. On grass only, 1487 to 1855. So quite a substantial breed effect. Again, look at grass clover, just the breed effect, 1939 to 2288. So substantial breed effect. But then look at, we'll say, the, just the clover effect, 1487 to 1939, actually an even bigger effect, and the cross spread the same. But it gets really interesting when you actually look at uh, the Halstein Friesian on grass, the, uh, you know, which is the industry. 1487 as against the cross spread on grass clover, 2288. Plus 800 euros a hectare, a 54% jump in profits at a sort of a middle range of profits. It's a massive difference, our competitive advantage. It is a game changer. Yes, but only if we act on it. Thanks. So, you know, from an industry perspective, we need to improve the overall performance of how we manage staff and, and deal with people, both from a farm owner's point of view and from, you know, young people and their expectations of what they're going to get. Yeah, we've, what we have done is, is we've actually made a lot of mistakes along the way and, and learned a lot of lessons and, and still are. That's why you've got to have a as a positive team that they're willing to contribute because often in farming it, they, you can't just turn up nine till five and go home when significant weather events happen or it's the middle of calving and you've, you've had a rough day and there's cows calving you, you have to do that and so you, you want someone that's going to go the extra mile with you in those challenging times that's about the stage where i actually really realized that people were the most important part of our business you know it's 
It's so much easier when you get the right person. If you've got the wrong person, it makes the whole experience so negative and, and drawn out. And that's why I think a lot of people don't enjoy this side of the business because we often get it wrong and then it's hard to, hard to correct it. So you've got to be honest in recruitment. Not, sugarco not sugarcoating you know, what, it, what the farm is. Be realistic. Realistic expectations. So when they turn up to work, you know, expecting a nice cosy job and they, they got a, the first job is to walk up the hill. You know, that, that's not going to sit too well with them and they won't, they won't last. Thank them for doing a good job. When things go really well, celebrate it. When things don't go so well, you know, talk about it. So they can learn. That, that, they really don't enjoy not... Jim has a good saying that people don't get out of bed to be idiots. Sometimes I wonder whether it just comes naturally to some of people. But... Uh, <laughs> But, but, but in general, people, you know, they get up wanting to do a good job. So, so harness that energy and, and, help, and help them get there. The best thing you can do is, is take them for a farm walk, something like that. If they can't keep up with you when you're doing a farm walk and that's really important to you, there's no point hiring the guy that uh, can't jump over the gate if that's, if that's what you really want. So uh, you know, it all comes down to your standards. But seeing them out there in action, anyone can sit at a table and tell you how good they are, but once, once you get them out there, then you might actually, you know, some of the more of that instinct stuff comes out. The Positive Farmers Annual Dairy Conference is aimed at farmers, inspective of size, who are committed to trying to do a good job on their farms. It does not matter how many, whether you have 40 cows or 400 cows.